Hello again. In this lesson, we're going back to the, the discussion of Mariology, the theological consideration of Mary and her, her role within the divine economy or, or plan of salvation. I actually really enjoy this section of the Catechism because it helps to explain or gives us reasons why the virginal conception of Christ is so important. The Catechism will sometimes do this where it will enumerate reasons why it was fitting that God would act in a certain way or God would do something the way that he, in fact, did it. And so we're going to take a look here at beginning in paragraph 502. The eyes of faith can discover in the context of the whole of Revelation the mysterious reasons why God, in his saving plan, wanted his son to be born of a virgin. These reasons touch both on the person of Christ and his redemptive mission, and on the welcome Mary gave that mission on behalf of all men. Now, I love this this paragraph because it tells us something that's so distinctively Catholic, that the eyes of faith can discover reasons for God working in a particular way that we can reflect with the eyes of faith on the fittingness of God having acted in a particular way or having done something in a particular way. And so it's, it's marvelous because the ways of God, while mysterious, are intelligible. We can uncover reasons f- for God's action in our world. Okay, Maybe not discover all those reasons because the mysteries are by their very nature infinitely intelligible, but we still can discover some of those reasons. Okay, so we're going to be enumerating the ones that the Catechism goes over. So let's jump back into the Catechism here, paragraph 503. The first reason, we are told, is that Mary's virginity manifests God's absolute initiative in the Incarnation. Jesus has only God as Father. He was never estranged from the Father because of the human nature which he assumed. He is naturally son of the Father as to his divinity, and naturally son of his mother as to his humanity, but properly son of the Father in both natures. Okay, so it first shows God's absolute initiative. What is required on the part of humanity is not an initiative. We don't get the ball rolling with when it comes to salvation. God does, okay? What humanity's part is, is exemplified by Mary simply an acceptance of, a belief in, and an obedience to God's own initiative. So that's the first lesson that we can derive from the virginal conception of Christ. shows God's absolute initiative. He is the one who initiates salvation and not us. Okay, secondly, this is in paragraph 504. Jesus is conceived by the Holy Spirit in the Virgin Mary's womb because he is the new Adam who inaugurates the new creation. You can read the rest on your own there. But this is an important fact. Just as Mary is the new Eve, so Christ is the new Adam, meaning he is now the, the sinless one who will bring into existence a new race of perfected humanity. Okay? And that's what really the church is all about. It is the home for those who have been made new creatures in this race of the new Adam. I want to come back to this last point here of Jesus being the new Adam because he inaugurates a new creation. That brings us to an important point that sometimes I think uh, people overlook, that being a a Christian is not just simply being uh, being a, a moral person or a good person or following Jesus as one follows a kind of guru or master, but it really means becoming a new creature, becoming a different sort of being altogether, being made new in Jesus Christ. So it really is a supernatural life which Jesus, the new Adam, inaugurates. Okay, now Let's come back to the reasons that the, the Catechism enumerates for the fittingness of, of the virginal conception of Jesus. Take a look at paragraph 505. By his virginal conception, Jesus, the new Adam, ushers in the new birth of children adopted in the Holy Spirit through faith. How can this be? Participation in the divine life arises not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. The acceptance of this life is virginal because it is entirely the Spirit's gift to man. The spousal character of the human vocation in relation to God is fulfilled perfectly in Mary's virginal motherhood. Okay, now that's sort of a, that's sort of a mouthful right there, but, but what is it saying? It's telling us that 
we have in Jesus Christ a new birth. Just as we are, we are made new creatures in Christ, we are born anew by the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay? So the virginal conception of Christ indicates the new birth that all Christians undergo. If they're genuine uh, Christians, they, they undergo this new birth that happens in baptism and is perfected in mature faith, hope, and love. Okay? Now, moving on to the next, paragraph 506. Mary is a virgin because her virginity is the sign of her faith unadulterated by any doubt and of her undivided gift of herself to God's will. It is her faith that enables her to become the mother of the Savior. Mary is more blessed because she embraces faith in Christ than because she conceives the flesh of Christ. Okay, very important. So her, her virginity is a sign of her complete self-gift to God, her undivided fidelity to the plan of God. She is not divided in her faithful obedience to the, the plan of God. And so she really is a model for us in that respect because you know, many of us, most of us, we want to be, if we're Christians, if we're faithful Christians, we want to be obedient to the will of God in our lives, but our allegiances are divided. We want to do this, that, or the other. We want to have God and something else. But Mary simply desired to be, the, as she calls it, calls herself, the handmaid of the Lord. She wanted to be completely at the disposal of God's loving plan for herself and for all humanity. And for this reason, uh, wisely, we are told that Mary is more blessed because of her faith and obedience than even because of her being the mother of Jesus according to the flesh. Now, I think it's important to say that while Mary didn't have doubts about God's plan, that her, that her faithful obedience was completely undivided, we don't want to suggest ever, and I've mentioned this before, but I think it bears repeating, we don't want to suggest that somehow Mary's obedience was thoughtless, okay, that it was mindless. She wondered, probably, certainly, more than most of us do, about the ways of God. How can this be? You know, her first question when she is announced, when the angel Gabriel, rather, announces that she's going to be the mother of the Savior. She wonders, she thinks about. You could almost make the claim that Mary is the greatest of the theologians, that, that somehow, not that she went to school and got a PhD, but rather she thought about the ways of God, pondered the ways of God, contemplated the ways of God more deeply than any other human being. She's a model of Christian contemplation, as a matter of fact. Okay? So we don't want to suggest that somehow obedience in, for Christians is, oh, is mindless. No, it is always an obedience that involves the intellect. It always involves understanding and judgment. Okay? It doesn't negate, faith does not negate, and obedience does not negate the intellect. It actually perfects the intellect. All right, moving on. Paragraph 507, and this is the last of the reasons that the Catechism enumerates for the fittingness of the virginal conception of Christ. At once virgin and mother, Mary is the symbol and the most perfect realization of the church. The church indeed, by receiving the word of God in faith, becomes herself a mother. By preaching and baptism, she brings forth sons who are conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of God to a new and immortal life. She herself is a virgin who keeps in its entirety and purity the faith she pledged to her spouse. Now that is such a profound point and it's one that we're going to come back to again when we discuss the church, but that Mary is a type of the church. So that just as Mary receives the very word, capital W, word of God into her womb by her faith and then presents that, brings that, that word made flesh into the world, so the church virginally receives the word of God into herself, that's why we call the church a she, the very bride of Christ, receives the word of God and then becomes the mother of new creatures born by the power of the Holy Spirit to a new life in Jesus Christ. And so what we see in Mary is, as I say, is a type of the church. For this reason, actually, the, in the Second Vatican Council, the, the, the church's discussion of or teaching on the Blessed Virgin Mary takes place not in a separate constitution, but in fact is part of the divine, or excuse me, the dogmatic constitution on the church. Um, that the church is seen uh, most brilliantly in the light of the Blessed Virgin Mary, who is the type of, uh, of the church. Uh, we're going to have to stop right there.
We'll see you next time.